I know there's things you cannot tell me. But I also know there's a story here, and I think everybody will hear about it. Do you think your paper has the resources to take that on? I do. Do you? The Boston priest molested kids in six different parishes over the last 30 years. The church found out about it and did nothing. We haven't committed any long-term investigative resources to the case. No, we haven't. And that's the kind of thing your team would do. Spotlight. Guys, listen. Everybody's going to be interested in this. Obviously, the church will fight us very hard. I'm trying to get some background information. I don't want you recording this in any way, shape, or form. Nothing. We understand you've settled several cases against the church. I can't discuss that. There aren't any records of any of these settlements. Nope. When you're a poor kid from a poor family, and when a priest pays attention to you, it's a big deal. How do you say no to God? Spotlight. Is this the tip line? You think he's got something? I want to keep digging. We need to focus on the institution. Show me that it came from the top down. I'll try to silence anyone who speaks out. You leave me alone, you hear me, goddammit? 6% act out sexually. 6% is 90. 90 priests. If there were 90 of these bastards, people would know. Maybe they do. You're going to give me the names and the names of their victims. Are you threatening me? I was doing my job. Yeah, you and everyone else. I am here because I care. We're going to tell this story. We're going to tell it right. I can't believe it. We can keep this between us until we all get on the same page. Is that why we're here, to get on the same page? We've got two stories here. A story about degenerate clergy, and a story about a bunch of lawyers turning child abuse into a cottage industry. Which story do you want us to write? Because we're writing one of them. I'm not crazy. They control everything. This is not just Boston. It's a whole country. It's a whole world. They knew! It could have been you. It could have been me. It could have been any of us. This trail is freaking awesome. Not a bad way to start the final keynote of ONA 15. Uh, good afternoon. My name is David Smidra. I'm the editorial director of Google Play Newsstand. And I'm also the only co-chair of ONA 15 who does not hail from Los Angeles. I've lived and worked in Boston for almost seven years. And anyone who spends a few years in Boston cannot escape the city's unique character. The puritanical backbone, which comes in handy when we get nine feet of snow, the camaraderie of friends and families whose paths for many decades and longer have woven through the same schools, neighborhoods, and workplaces. The almost genetic belief in community, loyalty, a clear-eyed notion of right and wrong, and of course, the church. You cannot talk about Boston without talking about the church. But let me come back to that. A few years ago, at a different journalism conference, one perhaps not quite as well attended as this one, uh, I listened as Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein looked back on Watergate 40 years after their work. They were asked if any work of investigative journalism rivaled Watergate's ambition, its challenges, and overall impact. Their answer was the investigation of Boston area children being sexually assaulted by Catholic priests as conducted by the Boston Globe Spotlight Team. And now, like Woodward and Bernstein's work at the Washington Post, which was dramatically told in All the President's Men. The story of the Globe's groundbreaking investigation is now getting the Hollywood treatment. Spotlight in theaters on November 6th and already earning rave reviews at film festivals around the world tells how a small, driven, highly effective reporting team debunked the church's spin and excuses, broke open long-covered wounds that were never allowed to heal, and exposed a network of negligence and self-protection, excuse me, self-serving protection by church and secular leaders in a region where the religious and political ties run so long and so deep that it has always been hard to tell where the church stops and the government leaders begin. One character in Spotlight, as you just saw, tries to explain how he fell prey to an attack from a priest by asking, how do you say no to God? More than a dozen years ago in Boston, 
For these reporters, the question might well have been, how do you investigate God? The answer, as we will hear, involves some of the earliest and best examples in our profession of data journalism, posting source documents on the web, and the cultivation of online communities comprising sources and individuals impacted by the Globe story. So let's meet this incredible group of journalists. Leading the Spotlight team from 1999 to 2006 was Walter Robinson. He's worked at the Globe as reporter and editor for 43 years and is now the Globe's editor at large. Michael Resendiz is a senior investigative reporter for the Spotlight team. In addition to his work on the clergy sex abuse story, he shared a Pulitzer Prize awarded to the Globe staff last year for coverage of the bombing of the Boston Marathon. Sasha Pfeiffer is a Boston Globe columnist and reporter covering nonprofits, philanthropy, and wealth. She has also been a senior reporter and host of All Things Considered and Radio Boston at WBUR, and a host of NPR's nationally syndicated Here and Now. Matt Carroll was a Globe reporter for more than 20 years, and today he runs the Future of News initiative at the MIT Media Lab across the street from my office in Kendall Square at Google, which provides space for journalists to discuss the thorny issues of the day works with members to create projects that address real-world media issues and looks for cutting-edge storytelling story and reporting tools. And leading this discussion is Josh Singer, the screenwriter of Spotlight. Josh also wrote the screenplay for The Fifth Estate about the rise and fall of WikiLeaks and its enigmatic leader, Julian Assange. He has written and produced episodes of The West Wing, Law and Order, Special Victims Unit, Lie to Me, and Fringe. Ladies and gentlemen, our final keynote of ONA 15, the Boston Globe Spotlight team. So, uh, first of all, uh, I want to thank ONA15 and David uh, for having us. Uh, it's really delightful to be here. The panel's a little larger than when I was here two years ago. Uh, and uh, I want to uh, uh, say what an honor it is to share the stage with these guys, uh, who are uh, the true heroes, um, and uh, uh, who I have had the great uh, good fortune of spending a good part of the last three years with uh, uh, investigating. Uh, and so, uh, before we get to a couple clips, and we do have a couple clips, uh, I wanted to ask these guys, uh, you guys are used to asking the questions, what was it like to have to answer them? Well, Mark uh, Ruffalo came to my house, and uh, <laughs> the very first thing he did was open up a notebook and uh, start asking me questions, and the second thing he did was turn on his uh, iPhone and start recording uh, the interview, and he uh, videoed my coffee table and the books on my bookshelf. And I was a little bit stunned, and I was a little bit taken aback. And then I thought about all the times I had done this to people, and I said, this is justice. I deserve this. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I mean, in some ways, it's a little unnerving. You know, you have people asking you, I mean, in my case, Rachel McAdams wanted to know not just what I wore, and she wanted to know what I like to eat, and how often do you have dinner with your husband, and what kind of family did you grow up in, and what, what was your religious background, and that was a real turning of the tables for a lot of us. And even with you, Josh, and Tom McCarthy, the director, they came to Boston repeatedly and spent time interviewing us, and it, it was a little unsettling to be the one answering all the questions, and sometimes the questions were personal. I, I remember Josh once asking, how did this affect your marriage? You know, you had just gotten married, and you were working really long days, and and then I thought, oh, our personal lives are going to be portrayed in this movie, potentially. And so you realize how vulnerable we were in a way. And I think, I think it was a good experience for us to remember what that experience is like for the people we do it to routinely. You know, I, uh, uh, before I mention Michael Keaton, I want, I want to say that uh, uh, the trailer you just saw, I, I, we hope you see the movie because Esquire said that this trailer is more explosive than any film that has an actual explosion in it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, I first, uh, I was delighted to find out Michael Keaton was playing me. Actually, to have anybody play me would be, would be great. But uh, I, I was the Globe's Metro editor in the mid-90s, and I was at a Metro editor's conference at the Pointer Institute, and this film, The Paper, had just come out where Michael Keaton played a Metro editor. Great film, right? It's a great film. Uh, and, and it's so true to life. So I was delighted, and, and when I met him in New York uh, early last summer for the first time, we were 30 minutes into our, con 30, minutes into, 30 seconds into our conversation when he said, uh, you know, almost in relief, you really don't have much of a Boston accent. 
because, you know, actors hate to do Boston accents. And uh, he had, it turned, I said, how did you know that? It turned out he had watched all, every videotape I'd ever been on of, you know, CNN or MSNBC or NPR. And uh, so he had my voice down, he got my mannerisms down. Uh, and uh, I, I think these actors, it's pretty amazing for them to play real people. Uh, and they took full advantage of it. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was interesting. Brian, I went out to dinner with Brian Darcy James the first time we met out in New York, and he was asking me how to pronounce certain words, and um, then we were just talking about family and our jobs and stuff, and then I'd sort of see him like leaning in closer to me like this, <laughs> and I'd start going like this, and I was like, but he was just trying to study me and pick up mannerisms and stuff, and the, the attention to detail is incredible in a movie, like, like uh, everyone's saying, and you know, he's got the glasses on the string, and there's a cup of Dunkin' Donuts coffee on my desk the whole movie, you know, it's not the stuff anyone's going to notice but me, basically, and you know, these guys, but it was, it was really cool to see how hard they worked in this. As one extra little detail, they let us on the set a lot, it was quite amazing. There were scenes in the movie where we were just off camera. But I remember that oftentimes Michael Keaton would walk around with these big headphones and people said to us, oh, they're listening to Rob, he's listening to Robbie's voice. Because Robbie had certain words where there's, remember he says Monday, Monday instead of Monday? And so Michael was listening all the time to what Robbie sounded like to try to replicate that voice. We, we had, uh, when we had sat with these guys, we taped them uh, just so we could, you know, make sure we had all the information. They were kind enough to let us tape them. And, and so he literally, at some point I cross paths and I, and I hear my voice coming out of his ears. And I'm like, what are you listening to? And it turned out he was listening to the tapes of us interviewing uh, these folks. I, I will say, you know, one thing that was, has been, um, for me, really wonderful, uh, is from the very beginning, Tom, our director, who co-wrote the movie with me, uh, was very focused on verisimilitude. Uh, and in a way that, you know, I think the movie hopefully will reach a mainstream audience, but the way we crafted it is not mainstream. I mean, we don't have two protagonists going after the church. We have six. We have these four, and then we have Ben Bradley Jr. and Marty Barron, played by John Slattery and B.F. Schreiber. It's a true ensemble, which is pretty much unheard of these days uh, in, in a sort of major motion picture. And Tom wanted to get it right from the very beginning. And so we really, we spent a lot of time with these guys, uh, you know, coming up, bothering them repeatedly. They were kind enough to spend their, their the time with us. We went and talked to other Globe staffers. We talked to other lawyers who were affiliated with the case. Uh, we talked to really anyone in Boston who had touched on the case we could get to. And then when the actors came on board, they picked that up. And they really sort of spent the time, as did our costume, our, our, our wardrobe person, Wendy Chuck, our costume designer, uh, you know, our production designer, uh, uh, Steve Carter, you know, our DP Masa, uh, Takenaki, uh, you know, they really had spent, they, they, they really believed in what we were doing, which was, I, I thought, very special. Now, to that end, uh, and I want to preface this, so I'm showing you guys clips, you know, Tom and I discussed this, you know, ordinarily we want you to see the whole film. Uh, hopefully these clips won't ruin the film for you. Uh, but uh, I think they're useful in terms of having a conversation about what's in the movie. Uh, so if it's okay, Jerry, if you would run the, the, first, uh, the, the first sequence, the first two clips, that would be great. So uh, I recall you, Sasha, telling me at some point that after the story came out, there was this rumor about this incredible database that you guys had found. And that, and that, can you tell me, so what was it, other papers were asking about it? Or? We did, we started to get calls from other newspapers saying, we heard you guys have like this sort of like magic database that tells you how to find bad priests. And it was funny because it was incredibly tedious work. I mean, all of you know this, sometimes investigative reporting sounds glamorous, but in reality it can be very tedious and very monotonous. And when we came up with the idea of going through these archdiocesan directories, it's basically a phone book that every year the Boston Archdiocese puts out. It lists all its priests, where they're located, what their status is. And we realized that sick leave, awaiting assignment, clergy personnel office, these were often signs of a priest who had an abuse allegation made and they were yanked out of a parish. It actually might mean you were sick or you had a drinking problem. It often was a sign of a, of a, of a sexual molester. So I will never forget this tedious work. I can remember having directories in my lap and they were really, like you saw, they, they were listed like this, and so we'd take turns calling out the name, somebody would enter it into the database, then somebody else would take the books and would shift the database and enter it into the computer. And I always say that I think I had 20-20 vision before, I think by the time it was over, we had all eroded our eyesight 
doing that project. <laughs> but this ended up being an incredible resource because by the time we began getting anecdotes from victims and lawyers, plus getting files unsealed over time, inevitably it often matched up with our database. When a complaint was made, we would go to our database and sure enough, that year, a priest got taken out of circulation. So it was an amazing thing that we didn't know if it was valuable at the time, it turned out to be invaluable. You know, we, we started out being asked to investigate one priest who had been in the news, been written about by the Globe, the Herald, the Phoenix, had been on TV. And we wanted to go deep on this priest and we had a new editor and we were frightened to death because he had asked us to do this. So we called everybody and very quickly we discovered that there was a lot more than one. We thought maybe 10, 12, I think we were up to 13 by the time uh, we were talk talking to uh, Richard Seip. And, and we were trying to figure out how do we, if he said 90, if it's that many, how do we get there? And this was the, really the only way, there were no public records to speak of to get at it that way. And, I, and, and this is, remember, 2001, and believe me, I'm a 20th century guy still. Um, <laughs> I remember one day walking up to Matt, who was beginning to enter this stuff, and I saw on his screen something that went, had lines going that way and lines going this way, and I said, what is that? And he said, that's a spreadsheet. <laughs> <laughs> It was my, my first spreadsheet. I'm, I'm, I'm actually on my third now, but. Uh, yeah, you know, and so it was, and it, how long, what is it? It was all of you guys, you know, uh, for about three weeks, is that yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, this was a magic database, but what people didn't realize is we built the database. We right. made the database. And, and it did take about three weeks of continuous effort. It's all we did for about three weeks. Right. So what, what, I, what I really love about that scene is it really shows the drudgery of what it lies behind so much investigative work. It was not real fun. It was really boring. But you just sat there for hour after hour going through the books and typing it in. But it, it was such an effective and, tool. And you don't know in the moment whether what you're doing really has any purpose or will be valuable right. down yeah. the road. And that's part of what I think is brilliant about this movie, I have to say, and what's so stunning about what Josh and Tom did is they took work that is real drudgery and somehow they made it seem like a thriller. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Robbie likes to say that it's actually a demoralizing movie for us because what took us five months to do, they were able to do in two hours. Two hours and five minutes. Well, it helps when you can take three weeks, four, 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 uh, four people working on it, and you can do it in about 30 seconds. You know, it just makes oh. it. But to me, that is remarkable that, you know, so when I think about that, three weeks, four people's time, let's say you guys work, you know, 10, 12 hour days, right? So yeah. that's you know, at least, you know, 50 hours for each of you, that's 200 hours times three, that's 600 hours. 600 hours, people hours of hard work. You know, what, what, what journalism outlet today would give 600 hours on a shot in the dark? You had no idea if this was gonna actually pan out. I mean, uh, to me, that's, that's pretty remarkable. Um, and, uh, and it was something that I felt like, you know, from the very beginning, and we wrote a couple different versions of this, but we were always very excited about showing that, that drudgery, uh, if you will. Well, one thing that's great about investigative reporting nowadays, and you all know this, is it, in 2001, first of all, the church didn't have any public records, or so they thought, until the judge intervened. But, um, but, but we really had, when you wanted to find somebody back then, you had to go search. But nowadays, there's so much rich information available at our fingertips that even though there are fewer of us doing this kind of work, uh, we can all be a lot more efficient at it. Uh, that's one good thing about, uh, about investigative reporting is that you can get at things a lot quicker now than you once could. Well, and certainly Tom and I found that as we were investigating you all. Uh, it was very useful. I mean, the Globe's archives is terrific. And so one of the things that was a very useful thing for us was we spent a lot of time talking to you guys, and then we could go back and look at the actual, not only the articles that they'd put out, but the articles that had come before. Uh, there was a case, the Porter case, which the Globe covered substantially in 92 and 93, and that factors in a little bit into our story. And we were able to pull up all those articles. And so it, it is very useful, but we had to do the hard work. And in fact, I would say some of the things we discovered, we didn't discover until not only had we talked to you guys three or four times, but then we had to reach out and talk to other people, and they told us stuff that we didn't necessarily believe, and we went back and checked the archive. And so there was a fair amount of, 
us trying to mimic, uh, not nearly coming up to your standard, but trying to mimic what you guys do. Um, we, have, uh, we have another clip, uh, which I think is a good one, uh, where you get to see Ray Donovan in, uh, in full uh, Marty Baron mode. So why don't we run that one? <laughs> So, uh, so that's, uh, I don't know if any of you all have worked with Marty Barron. He is a treasure, a uh, national treasure and a real hero. Uh, and um, this is an email uh, which we got, speaking of documents, uh, so uh, Robbie was kind enough to go through his emails when we were researching this and send us ones that he thought were pertinent. Um, and this is an email that uh, he sent fairly early on uh, in this investigation, August 24th. They had literally been on this for 22, 24 days, and these guys had already come up with, as Robbie said, you know, a, a bunch of, of priests. And they went in and they said, look, we've got a bunch of priests. And Marty then, they had a meeting, and we don't have records of that meeting other than we have this email where Marty says, I may not have been entirely clear on my comments yesterday. My view is that any story should focus on church policy and practice, how the church responds when there are credible allegations. You know, and he goes on to say what that means to him, but then you know, the trick here, is to, it seems to me, is to have our stories focus on the church's policies and practices rather than on the seemingly large number of priests locally who have been accused of being sexual predators. And to me, when I read this email early on in, in talking with you guys, it was a little mind-blowing, because I thought about, in today's world, would, would, would this ever happen? <laughs> or would it just, would someone want to run to press with, you know, all of the priests? And I think what's remarkable is you guys spent six months on the story before you broke the first story, and then another year or so after. And, uh, and that six months, uh, the time you spent made for a story that when it came out in January was actually three or four stories, they were incontrovertible. They basically were incontestable. And, you know, instead of having revolt, you guys had a lot of people saying thank you. Uh, and that, to me, uh, felt very, um, it, it felt, you know, it's, it's a little bit best practices in journalism to me. Yeah, There's I think no uh, when we arrived at work, uh, the f on the morning the first story ran, uh, I think we fully expected there to be picketers in front of the Globe, which had happened before. The Globe's relationship with the Catholic Church was stormy anyway. But uh, instead of picketers, there was an eerie silence. And uh, a few minutes later, the phone started to ring and ring and ring and ring. And uh, the people who were calling, many of them were victims, and many of them were uh, conservative Catholics also. Uh, who were not blaming the messenger, not blaming the globe, but were really uh, irate that uh, the archbishop had uh, sullied an institution that they loved. So uh, there were a couple rewards for us. One was uh, we were gratified to uh, help so many of the survivors uh, of clergy sex abuse, but also we were gratified that uh, some of our own uh, critics were really happy with the work uh, we'd done, and that was really rewarding. The, uh in the first several weeks after we started to publish, we received calls from 300 victims of priests just in the Boston Archdiocese. And we began to get a sense that this was much, much bigger because we got calls from people all over the world, Australia, New Zealand, Europe, Ireland, all over the United States. And so many calls from so many distraught people that we even sought help from the Boston Area Rape Crisis Center uh, to, to refer people to, for counseling, because we're reporters, we, we're, we're not counselors. And you see uh, the, the scene, I think you saw in the trailer, uh, of, of one victim we met with, but we met with scores and scores of victims uh, over time. and. Uh, and yes, the re they, it was their stories and the resulting documents which really put the lid on this for the archdiocese. And one other thing I'd like to add is that uh, after uh, we got all these calls and we did all this research, that eventually uh, the number 90 that was supplied to us by Richard Seip turned out to be exactly right. And uh, I gotta say, uh, when I first uh, read the script, I was a little disappointed that uh, Richard was not played by an actual person who you see, but in fact, uh, 
he was an oracle for us. And uh, so somehow having his voice over the telephone, I came to believe was really appropriate. And also, I, I just want to say that Richard Seif is in the audience. Yeah, he's right over here. And uh, we're all really grateful to him. Our stories ran, we did get occasional calls from people who would say, you know, what is in the water in Boston? You know, what is wrong with your priest? And those are people who weren't getting that this is a system problem. And we now know from other reporting done around the world that when you can get into the file cabinets of your local diocese, oftentimes you will find this. Related, I got a few calls after our stories began to run. And people actually said, do you guys really think you're breaking some kind of secret here? You know, we always knew which priest you don't send your son away with for a ski trip for the weekend. And what I thought was so interesting about those calls is that we learned that there truly is, and this is the case with many kind of predators, they target certain types of people. They target sort of the weaker, vulnerable people. And priests were in a unique opportunity because of their intimacy with the parish to know who were those weak, vulnerable people, who were the broken homes, the single mothers, the kids struggling with sexuality issues. And they truly targeted in on those people. So the people who said they knew tended to be the stronger families who were less likely to be targeted. Those who were the targets were often not in the know. And I, I think that was another real tragedy of this. You know, I, you know, that, you know I, I heard that uh, very similarly. Uh, so uh, a friend of mine, Lawrence O'Donnell, lives in, uh, I work with him on the West Wing, and he's from Dorchester. And he said a similar thing to me when I first started uh, looking into this. And, uh, and it struck me that this is a collective action problem. Right, this is where, so one thing we try to do in the movie, I think everyone knows the church was not a great actor here. But I think what a lot of people don't think about is that it wasn't just the church. There were a lot of people who were looking the other way because the church is a good institution and why would you take down the church? And, and that is a problem, right? And, and it's that collective action problem, no one wanting to go up against that good institution. And that's why good local journalism is so important. That's why what you guys do is so important and why it is so important not to let it die out because you guys, the fourth estate, the fifth estate, you're the only check on this kind of corruption. Uh, and so it was, that was sort of what really motivated Tom and I, you know, once we started digging to, to get into it. I, one other thing I wanted to bring up, um, and this is for, for you, Matt, you know, Clay Shirky talks a lot about what the internet did Right? I mean, there, there's a lot of discussion about what the internet has done to newspapers, you know, in terms of <coughs> revenues. But here, the internet actually turned out to be a real help. Isn't that right? right? Yeah, I mean, this is the early days of the internet. And I often think that if we had done this 10 years earlier, it might have just stayed a local story. But it, because there was no social in those days, it was just really the, you know, the web and, and email, but it spread so fast. And, and one of the things that really helped ignite the story was we had primary source documents. We had the actual letters from the, from the bishop saying, okay, transfer Father Gagan now to another parish, even though he's abused priest. Don't tell the next Monsignor what he did. And so we were able to take those documents and put them online, which is actually relatively, it sounds, you know, it's just a reflex thing now. Everyone automatically does it. But in those days, it was a relatively new idea. And it really drove the issue. People could read the documents for themselves and see, oh my goodness, this is what you know, the, 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 the hierarchy was doing to these priests. And I think so. it's another reason we had no picketers, because people could right. go from the story and then read the actual documents, where the, which were the church's own documents. So people could say, people could see that uh, the information was solid and it was true, and it wasn't just writers from the globe expressing their opinions, that this was based on fact on, and there was documentation to prove it. And this, I mean, this will sound cliched, but this project really did remind me of the importance of questioning authority, right, of the institutions that need to be it really need to be probed and looked into. And one of the reasons I loved working for Robbie is, he, first he has sort of an uncanny nose for a lie, which, I, which is an interesting instinct, but he also had a sense of what are kind of the little, the little paid attention to seemingly boring agencies and organizations that people really don't bother to pay attention to as reporters? And what might they be doing because there's not much attention being paid to them? And Robbie wrote a Neiman Reports article about this in which I think you talked about what are the soft underbellies of institutions where we can't FOIA them? We couldn't send a public records request to the church because it didn't fall under that rule, but there are often other ways in. And I feel like that's this reminder of what are the, what are the agencies that no one pays attention to? They seem so dull that we barely f focus on them. Those are often places for great stories. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one, one of the great lessons we learned from this is that in any community, uh, we just assume that our iconic institutions are behaving properly that like priests are protecting children. And it didn't, it wasn't happening that way. And, and I mean, these, these crimes 
are unimaginable. And for most people that a church would condone and even um, uh, encourage, um, in fact, encourage this kind of behavior was, was, was really unimaginable. And the lesson we learned from that is, you know, um, even the best nonprofit institutions are run by fallible human beings and we should treat them uh, the same way we treat government agencies when we perform our due diligence. I, I, I do want to point out, even though the subject matter is somewhat dark, uh, these guys are a lot of fun to hang out with. Uh, and, uh, and so this movie is entertaining. Uh, and if you go to the theaters, it's not just dark, 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 because these are all great humans who are a lot of fun to hang out with, and you get to hang out with them on screen. Uh, so I just wanted to say that as a, as a as somewhere, I feel like uh, our distributor is tapping me on the shoulder to <laughs> remind everybody. Uh, uh, but, um, and I do want to give a shout out uh, before we open it up to questions. Uh, so Terry McKiernan is also here. He runs bishopaccountability.com. Uh, and in terms of getting documents out there and keeping them up, to keep people accountable. He's done God's work and also helped us tremendously. Uh, there are a number of cards at the end of the film that sort of demonstrate how far and wide this is spread. Uh, and, uh, and they're very, very, uh, I think they, they make a real impact. So uh, thank you to Terry as well, who's here. Um, so. Uh, huh? Yeah, sorry, bishopaccountability.org, my, my bad. Um, uh, so uh, I think uh, we should open it up to some questions, if that, if anybody, I don't know if anybody has any questions. Hi, my name is Emmanuel Turi, I'm from C-SPAN. I'm also from Ireland, and I could relate to your story, and I think you hit the nail on the head. I did a quick um, name check of the priests where I went to boarding school, and of the two that the students knew, who were problematic, and the stat I came out with was 5.5%, which is interesting. Um, I also think of the institution, going after the institution. I'd like you to elaborate a bit more on that. Um, I worked for the former cardinal, cardinal in Ireland when he was a priest, um, Cardinal Sean Brady. And if you look at his story or Google his story, it's very similar to what Bernard Law did. Now, he stepped on in the last year. I'm just wondering why you decided to go after the institution and the accountability to the institution and um, Cardinal Laud, who's still in the Vatican. Well, without the institution and its culpability and its cover-up, the vast majority of these crimes could not possibly have been committed. And the responsibility lay at the very top of the Catholic Church and even into the Vatican itself and to this day I think remains. In the vast majority of countries, uh, priests who abuse children are not removed from ministry. And uh, so uh, I think Marty Barron's charge to us uh, wasn't to say, use the trite expression, you know, it's not the crime, it's the cover-up. I mean, the crimes were horrific, but the, the cover-up, which allowed this to go on for so long, was. That, that, that stunned people far more, I think, in many, for many reasons than, than the individual acts themselves. You know, The Globe and many other media outlets had for years been writing individual stories about priests who abuse children. I used to cover the courthouse, and every time Mitch Garabedian filed a new civil lawsuit, I would dutifully write a story. Mitch Garabedian has filed another three suits uh, against Father John Gagan. But we didn't just want to write a story about priests who abuse children. We wanted to write a story about church officials who covered up for priests who abuse children. You know, the, the psychology of this is so warped. I mean, we know from the letters that the, the church thought the priests had sinned, you know, and we would forgive this sin. And it's, there was almost as if they were forgetting overlooking the fact that this is actually a crime. Sexual contact with a child is a crime, you know. And, and so priests would just be removed quietly and put in another parish. And again, in the pre-internet age, if you, if you transfer a priest from the South Shore of Boston to the North Shore of Boston, the South Shore people would probably never hear from him again. That couldn't happen today, but at the time it could. You could just sort of disappear somebody, and that's how it was dealt with over and over again. Yeah. I mean, I, I, one of the things that struck us is, you know, you all know, but we didn't know, the difference between a beat reporter and long-term investigative. And, and so there had been coverage, you know, by various beat reporters, right? But who has time as a beat reporter to go deep? Right, and what when Marty came in by putting this team on this project, they had six months to go deep, 
and it was there that they were able to actually get at you know, the real corruption within the institution. Yeah, and I think we try to make clear all the time that the Boston Globe by no means discovered clergy sex abuse. There were clergy sex abuse scandals all over the country before we came along. And uh, I think uh, it, it's really uh, exactly as Robbie said, what we did and no one else did, we, we proved there was a cover-up and we did it with the church's own documents. And I think uh, uh, that's what was so powerful about, uh, about our work. And just in direct answer to your question, you know, Sasha said a few minutes ago that we should always remember as uh, investigative reporters that our job is to question authority. And I think by holding uh, institutions, I think that holding institutions accountable and powerful individuals accountable for what they do and the actions to they take really goes to the core of what investigative reporting is. We have another question out there. <clears throat> Hi, Brenda Kazar with the Los Angeles Daily News. Is there something that you learned that, with hindsight, you would do differently now, whether it's in your approach or um, in dealing with certain sources or anything like that? I know one, one thing uh, that we would do differently is we'd be taking, I mean, we'd get a box of documents and put 10 pages online, cause, which seemed pretty cool, but now you take the whole box and put them online. Um, and I think back now of all those boxes of documents which are yeah. probably sitting in Iron Mountain, you know, buried with tons of dust, and it just kills me that they're not available as a resource for, for researchers and other reporters. Hi, I'm Kate Daly with the BBC. Uh, there's been some talk at the conference this week about trauma to reporters, um, whether it's people in, you know, who are responsible for monitoring Twitter feeds and getting direct footage from airstrikes. Can you talk a little bit about the effect that this reporting had on you and how you handled it? You know, actually, before we do that, I think we have a clip that, uh, <laughs> oddly, I think will... That's a good uh, way to duck a question. <laughs> no, no, no. No, no, We're going to answer that question, but I'd like to first answer it with a clip we have. Can we run our last clip, please? So... The answer to your question is, uh, I know my wife thought that we all had PTSD just from uh, the emotional toll on ourselves from hearing uh, so many stories like this. I, I just say for myself, I'm a, I think I'm a pretty tough guy, but it, this story made me on more than one occasion cry. And it should have. You know, the other effect uh, that uh, some of the survivors had on us uh, was to really give us incredible motivation to get to the bottom of the story. I mean, we were so uh, saddened and simultaneously outraged by the things we heard that uh, our determination just, uh, as a result, knew no bounds. I, go ahead. You know, I mean, I think, um, I think it was infuriating, actually, you know, because we met, we dealt with a lot of adult men who were telling us things that they never told anybody else, sometimes not even their wives, and they thought they were the only one. I mean, imagine that. Imagine you realize later, oh, it had been happening to a lot of people. But it had the effect, the abuse often had the effect of sort of stopping them in time. We're much more open about sexuality now than we were in the 50s and 60s, but imagine that it is the 50s and 60s and you're Catholic and priests are revered and, and sex is this very sort of verboten thing and your first sexual experience at this very formative age involves a priest and you don't know how to process it. And we met men who were kind of locked in time by that and it affected their ability to have any relationships ever again. And they would be articulate, thoughtful, smart guys stuck and that was infuriating and as Mike said, it makes you angry and actually anger is a huge motivator and I think that's what it was for us. I often worried more about these very intense, intimate conversations we had with these guys, and then we said, thank you, goodbye, and we hung up. And I often felt like I had to say to them, you may, as you process what we just talked about, you may want to make sure you're talking to people or call us back, because I kind of worried about the aftermath we would leave them with after this sort of blowing up this bomb in their life that they had repressed or kept quiet for 30 years. I do, I do remember very distinctly, actually, to go back to that whole trauma question, talking to a guy. I mean, we would have to sit down with these people for hours after hours, and we've been doing this for a series of months, and it was a late one afternoon, a guy calls in from I don't know, somewhere in the Midwest, I think, and he started telling me his story, 12-year-old boy befriended by the priest. And I remember thinking, I don't want to talk to this guy. I'm just, I can't deal with this anymore. 
and it was it was hard. I mean, you just had to keep struggling through. But at some point, it was just overwhelming after a while. I, I was like, I had a lot more empathy for social workers after after doing these stories. Yeah, because somebody had to stay compassionate, including on deadline, yeah. right? When calls are yeah. coming in and you have pressure on your on your back end, and you're trying to deal with someone who's quite traumatized. Yeah, I, I would also say, you know, it's interesting because Tom and I sat with a couple survivors. Uh, when we were doing research. And then uh, one or two we sat with again, you know, a couple years later when we went to film. And uh, they had gone downhill and it was incredibly upsetting. And I know you guys saw that uh, over and over again. And, you know, one guy in particular who was charming and funny and terrific and, you know, and is really struggling. And it was so upsetting and I realized they'd seen that with hundreds of folks, not just one. Uh, so. The other reason I think we like this clip is that actually happened, you know, and you can s clearly see that that's obviously a troubled guy, and there were many troubled priests, and why they were troubled is a, is a different conversation, a larger conversation. But, you know, what, part of the reason I love this project is it was a data project, it was a legal project, the Globe put up the resources to send its lawyers to court to get records unsealed, and it was ultimately successful in court, and it was a project that involved a lot of phone calls and door knocks. And, I mean, I think we all know in our business sometimes it's just hard to get away from your desk, but sometimes you only get stuff like that when you knock on the door. We had a case, we got to the point that all the, the, all the archdiocesan clergy personnel files had to be released, and we were just inundated with insane allegations that we couldn't even write about because, as Ben Bradley, the John Slattery character, finally said, we can't do these priest du jour stories anymore, right? We were onto the larger issues. We were looking at the resignation of Cardinal Law, the Archdiocese of Boston teetering on the brink of bankruptcy, but we had one case, a priest named Father Meffin, and he had worked in sort of like a school for women who wanted to be nuns, and several women had claimed that he had like initiated sexual contact with them and said it was like making love with Jesus Christ. And it, it, it sounded literally incredible. Like we were like, that can't actually be true. And I was writing that little story. It was gonna be a small part of a larger story. And sort of at 4 or 30 in the afternoon, I thought, oh, I gotta try to call the priest. And I sort of thought he's gonna hang up on me or he won't talk or I won't be able to find him. He answered the phone. We had a, probably at least a 45-minute conversation in which he, he told me everything. Yes, I thought that if we had sexual contact, that was a way to have them stages of intimacy with Jesus Christ, but not intercourse because that's sort of for the afterlife, and it was just crazy. But again, I sort of made a rookie error of not calling until 4.30 in the afternoon because, you know, it's sometimes we just forget that that yields the best thing you're going to get, and it became a great story just, you know, written under intense deadline pressure later in the day. Uh, I think we have time for maybe one more question. Uh, someone's been waiting patiently, and then... Uh, Hi, we'll I was wondering how you did run those interviews with Compassion under deadline. Did you have, towards the end, working from a, like a template, or this has worked before, let's try this? I think everyone was individual, based on what we were dealing with on the other end of the phone. You know, and you're sort of trying to test how much they can withstand in terms of questions, because obviously we needed a lot of details about what specifically had happened, what level of crime may it have been. So I think it's a case-by-case -case thing. And, and we had, uh, you know, we, the, the, the Globe, like almost all news organizations, has a practice. Uh, we do not identify victims or alleged victims of sexual abuse unless they want to be identified. So we were dealing with people who were, wanted to remain anonymous. So we had a, we tried to keep to a standard that we had to have two allegations allegations from two different people against a particular police priest plus some corroborating evidence before we would uh, uh, identify that priest in the paper but mm -hmm. but each time we got a call it was as Sasha said it was a different it was a different case and we had you know sometimes we had to make decisions on the fly um, uh, but ev you know every day uh, we, we we, in uh, 2002, we published over 600 stories on this, the four of us, and they added four more reporters to the team uh, shortly after the, I want to say, uh, shortly after the conclusion of the film, right. shortly after we published our first story. <laughs> Very funny. Uh, to, your, to your question, you know, uh, we were in effect giving psychotherapy to people, and needless to say, we had no training in that whatsoever. I mean, I remember I was in a room with, uh, two uh, survivors, they were a brother and sister, they'd both been molested by the, uh, the same priest and their parents were in the room. And it soon became clear that uh, the parents had never reported the abuse because they had another daughter who had a scholarship to a Catholic high school and they were fear that if they reported the abuse of their, their two younger children, their older daughter would lose her scholarship. 
and they were completely uh, guilt-ridden. And before long, everyone in the room was crying. And uh, I didn't have a clue about how to deal with it, and, uh, but somehow I did. And I think all of us just uh, uh, tried to be compassionate and intelligent and uh, followed our instincts, and, and thank God we had some. We had uh, just one Go one added. I, I, I think Sasha and I were both involved in this story. There was uh, one victim from my own Jesuit high school, which is right across the street from the Globe, um, who called us uh, to tell us about his abuse, and he wanted us to use his name and put it in the paper, and he had not, he had not yet told anybody in his own family, and we counseled him, it would be better not to put your name in the paper, at least until you tell somebody in your family. And, and in the he end, was I married. Think, he hadn't told his wife. Hadn't told his wife. And so there were times, I mean, you've probably all been through this, you're almost in a way protecting people from themselves. Sometimes people tell you things and you think, oh, you know, I'm not sure I'm going to use that. And this is a case where he said, your wife shouldn't read this in the newspaper first. You need to tell her. Um, so uh, just to wrap up uh, three things, first of all, I just want to tell everybody, you know, so this story is not over. Uh, you know, this is still happening to some extent, uh, hopefully less here, uh, but you know, it's still go ongoing. There's still more that the church needs to do, uh, you know, in terms of uh, pushing, uh, you know, lengthen, you know, not lobbying against statute of limitations, lengthening uh, to lengthen statute of limitations, reporting priests being much more transparent. I think uh, only 30 of 178 dioceses actually have lists of abusive priests on their websites. It should be all of them. And that's just here in the US. Abroad, they don't even have norms. Uh, there are norms here, which are somewhat weak. Abroad, there aren't, aren't even norms. Uh, you know, uh, there are just guidelines about how a uh, diocese should deal with this. So this is a story that needs to continue to be reported on. That's number one. Number two, uh, I want to thank all of you guys for doing what you do, uh, because without doing what you guys do, uh, corruption like this continues to happen. Uh, and uh, number three, I want to thank you guys for what you've done and what you continue to do. Uh, and thank ONA for having us.